All right. So I'm very excited to welcome Bill Simmons, um, who is our featured speaker today. And any of you who've been um, with Hemlock Society for a while will definitely know Bill. Um, Bill has been um, a board member and um, a active um, member of Hemlock Society for a long time. So we're really lucky to have him today um, to speak about advanced directives, as well as um, his wonderful website, which you can find at finalexodus.org. Bill is a retired attorney and has had a long time interest in end of life um, issues and planning and has worked really hard to create resources um, that will help people uh, really properly prepare for um, the end of life. So he will be talking specifically about advanced directives today and how to address um, dementia, which is something that um, standard advanced directive templates often do not. So Bill, welcome and thank you so much um, for uh, coming today to share your expertise and uh, your exciting new website. Okay, I'm calling this program today, Advanced Directives 101, what they are and what they're not, and what's in the forms and what's not in the forms. Why well, have an advanced directive? There are two main purposes. State your wishes when you're ill and you can't speak for yourself. And appoint someone who will speak for you. That person is called your agent. Sometimes the name proxy or surrogate are used. In fact, there's a national organization that only uses the word surrogate. The legal term is agent. On the advanced directive forms also state your after death wishes, your burial wishes, your organ donation, and uh, state that your wish that your agent be your court appointed conservator. That's a typical provision. I've never understood why, but I've got it in my form too. Also, typically, they define your agent's authority. They give directions for filling out the form. They give blank lines for wishes not covered in the form. And next, what advanced directives are not. While your doctor, hospitals, and their staff should be, should by law comply with them, they don't carry the same force as doctor's orders. Similar to advanced directives, POLST forms. POLST stands for Physician's Order for Life-Sustaining Treatment. They carry more weight because they are a doctor's order. In fact, emergency medical technicians must comply with POLST, but they can and do ignore your advanced directive. What these are and are what these are and do can be discussed in the Q&A period, so we can get more into post at that time. To become a document as an address directive, it has to be legal. And they must be then, to do that, executed as prescribed by state laws. In California, it varies from state to state. In California, it must be notarized. There are witnessed by two people. Generally, the witnesses can be about anybody except those who are in your will or in your trust and may receive property from you and those that are in your health care. So otherwise, you can pick your friends or your neighbors. To find a form you like, uh, Excuse me, advanced directives can be do it yourself. Just find a form you like and modify it to fit your wishes. 
lawyers are not necessary. In fact, most lawyers' forms aren't all that useful, in my opinion, especially in an emergency situation because they're too long. Which is more important, your advanced directive or your conversations? What conversations, you may ask? Well, those with your family and your agent before you finalize your advanced directive. You just don't go to your hospital or your doctor's office and fill out an advanced directive. It really deserves, for your own benefit, some time and thought. And part of that time needs to be spent discussing it with members of your family and others, such as close friends or your minister. So, believe it or not, advanced directives are not as important as conversations. As a lawyer, I found it very hard to believe this until I became a, 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 a volunteer for San Diego Hospice and I got involved in the Right to Die movement. Many people convinced me that conversations were more important, especially conversations with your agent, followed up the way I like to do things with a letter to your agent and explain your wishes in detail. As a local physician, Bob Uslander says, the advanced directive is not important if your agent is present. And there you have it. That's why conversations are more important because your agent needs to know what your wishes are. And there are more reasons. Busy doctors don't have time to pull out and read your directive, and many don't even try. When planning, uh, the conversations help you clarify your thinking, find out who would be your best agent, and have your family and perhaps others feel like they are involved. And most of all, to find out if someone would be opposed to your wishes. And secondarily, to have the opportunity to get such a person to change his or her mind and at least not be a problem when you die. What most, most advanced directives don't do is they don't deal with a dementia. However, there are supplements to advanced directives that do deal with dementia, and we'll look at uh, one of those and also at mine, which does deal with dementia. And many years ago, or excuse me, a few years ago, Hemlock had and may still have a supplement for COVID, a supplement which I signed when COVID first came out. So supplements can play an important role, especially if your advanced directive doesn't deal with dementia. They don't cover methods for shortening life, such as VSED. Well, that's voluntary stopping eating and drinking, as most of you know. A few dementia supplements do this. My directive form discussed in a few minutes covers both dementia and the related issue of stopping eating and drinking, but it's called stopping eating and drinking by advanced directive because it's not voluntary anymore. With my form, no supplement is necessary. By the way, how do you plan for dementia just in case you get afflicted? Basically, it is a stark choice because there is no cure to dementia. Either live with it for many years until you die, do you want to put your family through that and your cost, your estate through that? Some do. Or end your life early via VSED or inhaling an inert gas such as nitrogen, thus losing some or even many good years of life. Living in Nevada is different, and I can go into that in question and answer period if you like. Let's look at a few forms now, starting with standard forms and one supplemental form. Um, here's my favorite form for standard form. It's, it's put together by our outfit, 
called the Commons, and it's available. It's not. It's available to anyone that wants to use it, and it's written in a real friendly, chatty way. And I'll get into that right now. I'm looking at just the first top half of the first page. The Creative Commons form is found at the Coalition for Compassionate Care California, or it can be found from the Creative Commons website too, I believe. I looked at it a few years ago. I like it because it's animated in the sense that you have cartoon characters with it. It's folksy, it's simple, and it's easy to understand. For someone who has given his or her end of life any thought, it is a very, who has not given his or her in the life very any thought. It is a very good form. Another form that is good for the uninitiated is five wishes. It costs a few dollars online uh, or they'll send it to you. And it has a slight Catholic bent, but it's basically a very good form. Okay, let's go back to the Creative Commons form. It's in three parts. One, to choose a healthcare agent. Part two, to make your own healthcare choices. And part three, to sign the form. I think it takes about seven pages to do all that. So part two, which is on page six, uh, it covers these specifics. I couldn't show the form the page, it didn't come out well, and I didn't have the technology to make it work better. So I've copied the, the words into the, this slide in the next slide or two. So you are to think about what makes your life worth living. You put an X next to all the sentences that you must agree with. So here's the first X opportunity. My life is only worth living if I can talk to my family, wake up from a coma, feed, bathe, or take care of myself, be free from pain, live without being hooked up to machines, or I'm not sure. I don't think that's a good way to go, but it's interesting that the form has this statement as an option. Okay, let's look at more of page six. My life is always worth living, no matter how sick I am. If I am dying, it is important for me to be at home or in the hospital, or again, I am not sure. There's another question. Is religion or spirituality important to you? Yes or no? And what should you doctors know about your religion or spirituality? And it gives you two lines to add something if you wish. And I would probably put there, I'm not very religious, but I have some spiritual leanings. Um, or I might be more blunt and just say I'm an agnostic. Let's go on. Let's look at the another commonly used form because it's statutory. It's written into the legis into the state law created by the legislature. Page one is simply an introduction and instructions. Page two is blank lines for names and contact info. And page three has the guts. So here is page three of the California form. Advanced Health Directive form. Okay, agent's obligation. And so you get to explain your agent's obligation. And you can change anything in here you want. You can cross it out, add to it, or uh, deal with it that fits your needs. Agents post-death authority. My agent's authorized to donate organs, tissues, and parts, and so on, or to have an autopsy. And uh, my agent, no, this is not what, my agent can do, I can do this. If a conservator of my person needs to be appointed by court, the agent designated here 
in my form is to be my conservator if the court agrees, of course. And that's kind of the guts. Here's some more. Instructions for health care. So I'm not going to read all these, but I'm going to read the headings. So end of life decisions. I direct that my health care providers or others uh, follow this choice. I choose not to prolong my life. Or in B, I choose to prolong my life. And then I would like to be relieved from pain. And I can state my other wishes um, if I want to add to those choices that are up above. Now I'm going to move quickly to a dementia supplement. It's from Compassion and Choices. It gives nine choices and then another on food and drink. The three choices for the nine are for each live as long as possible, treat me but not aggressively, or allow a natural death. Okay, remember those three choices because when you read the form itself, it's printed after every one of these. But I don't have that kind of space in my slides. Number one, if my physician or healthcare provider has determined my dementia has progressed to advanced or late stage, then I want to live as long as possible, or treat me but not aggressively, or allow me a natural death. Number two, if I require around-the-clock assistance and supervision, then I want to live as long as possible, treat me but not aggressively, allow a natural death. Number three, if I no longer recognize my loved ones, then I want one of those three choices. Here are the rest. Four, if I am able to walk or move safely without assistance or from a caregiver, then I want one of those three. Live as long as possible, treat me but not aggressively, or allow a natural death. Five, if I am unable to bathe and clean myself without assistance from a caregiver, then I want one of those three things. Six, if I am unable to remain at home and live and have to live in a nursing facility, then I want one of those three. If I no longer have control of my bladder and my bowels, then I want one of those three. If I am no longer aware of my surroundings, then I want one of those three. If I am un unable to communicate my thoughts or needs, then I want one of those three. Okay, well, we've gone through those fairly quickly. I've lost track of time. Um, and I want to spend much more time on my advanced directive form, which you'll find at finalexodus.org. Um, now you've got my website. Excuse me. Yes, my website. That is 100% new. I just put all this new content up uh, around the first of the year. And this is a beautiful picture taken by my wife from Columbia River. I think it's appropriate for the title of my website, which is planned before the sun goes down. Let's just take a quick look at the different sections. First of all, we get into planning. Um, why, what is, why conversations. I've actually covered much of this already. Then we get into medical aid and dying, the End of Life Option Act in California. And then we get into VSED, which I'll be discussing in, in a moment. And then we look at other choices, such as inert gases, pulse orders, and things that shouldn't be considered as alternatives, such as carbon monoxide. And then I have a long discussion on dementia and dementia supplements and the problem of incapacity, which we'll discuss uh, today. And then I have a section on hospice. And then I have a lot of subsections on advanced directives. And one of those is my end of life form, 
uh, excuse me, my quality, my three page advanced directive form, not thinking very well today. And then I've got a section called deep dive, which just explains some things in more detail. And then I have many pages on resources. So that's my website. That's all on my first page. And it says at the top, as you might see, the terms of my directive are all on page two, the key terms anyway. So let's go to page two, look at the top if we can. Okay, we get, as you've seen before, authority of my agent and then special instructions to my agent. Um, you, my agent, are authorized or not authorized. I've jumped down to a question uh, that you have to fill out, a line that you have to fill out to um, override my specific decisions. You'll see this strange provision in several advanced directives. It, uh, it, many times your thinking isn't very clear when you're sick. And it's a good idea if your agent really understands what your last wishes are to allow your agent to override what you might be saying at the time. Your agent's able to think better. That's the idea. Think better than you can think at the time. And then special instructions to my agent and my attending physicians. Quality of my life is more important to me than living as long as possible. I understand that doctors, nurses, and others have a professional obligation to keep me alive. It is my directive that such obligation is less important than my autonomy as expressed in my choices below. All right, let's move to see all of the choices. If you can move that uh, slide, there we go, great. Um, okay, initial all that apply. These choices, numbers three through 5D are progressive. Uh, in other words, one and two are not necessarily progressive. So check as far down as you wish, but don't leave a blank after you get to number three. So my first choice is time-limited trials. I authorize trials to see if medical interventions might return me to the minimum quality of life I desire, as discussed with my agent. How long a trial goes is to be determined by my agent in consideration with the doctors. Number two, vegetative state allows a natural death with palliative care if I am in a vegetative or near vegetative state from which I'm unlikely to recover. Number three, discontinue medical interventions. If it appears that medical interventions are prolonging my life but not returning me to the quality of life I desire, then discontinue the interventions and begin comfort care only. Let me throw a comment in here. You'll see nothing in my advanced directive about medical procedures, medical choices, because you can't possibly cover all the situations and all the kinds of procedures that might be applicable to you at the time uh, of your grave illness. So that's why the letter to your agent is so important because your agent can spill out your wishes, uh, but your form, you can spill out your wishes in your letter to your agent, but the form doesn't get into anything such as that detail, other than to say, my quality of life is what's important to me. And that quality of life is what your agent must understand. Okay, number four, assisted feeding. If I am unable to feed myself, then spoon feed me whenever it seems to enjoy what I seem to enjoy and no more. Do not feed me or apply medical interventions such as tubes and IVs so that I might live longer. And here goes number five, where we really get into it. If this sentence is initiated and any of the choices A, B, C, or D are initial, they are not to be implemented if they put my agent or my caregivers at criminal risk. Wow, wonder what that means. Let's go back to some basics. 
in all states, suicide is legal. It didn't used to be. Government could take away your property and put you in jail if you failed to kill yourself. Those are gone. Those laws are gone. But the laws for assisting suicide are still there, and they are felonies. If you assist someone to die, you're committing a felony. So if a person has lost their capacity, what authority does your agent have? Well, your agent generally has the power to start and stop and terminate, in other words, or start new ones, any medical intervention, any medical procedure or prescription. Your agent has that control, even if you've lost capacity. But what if you lost capacity because you have dementia? Do the agents have authority to start instituting voluntary stopping eating and drinking? Of course, it's not so voluntary anymore because your agent is the one and your family is the one that would institute the, the stopping eating and drinking. So that's got a name. It's called AD, uh, SED, Stopping Eating and Drinking by AD by advanced directive, stopping eating and drinking by advanced directive. That's where your advanced directive states that you wish to stop eating and drinking. And you don't have the capacity to maybe even start that yourself, but your agent could start it if authorized by the advanced directive. So let's see when that might occur. Let's look at number five now that you have the background of why this is written in such a strange way. If my agent's not going to get in trouble, and my family, and my doctor, then uh, stop eating and drinking, A, whenever I show no desire to eat or drink. That's probably okay. I don't see a problem there. B, even if I show a desire to eat or drink, don't let me eat or drink. That's what five's all about. C, even if I say, utter, or otherwise indicate that I wish to eat or drink, then stop eating, stop me from eating and drinking. Don't feed me, don't give me any liquid, even if I ask for it. And, and D, even if I say other, otherwise indicate that I wish to live, don't feed me or give me any drink. That's really powerful. It's very unusual, but in one state, that's legal. And in the other states, in a couple of states, that's clearly illegal. And in most states, nobody knows whether the agent has that kind of authority. And a lot of people are very opposed to this approach to ending your life. So that's why five begins with the sentence. If this sentence is initialed and the uh, A, B, and C are also initialed, then my agent has to learn whether he's at risk by talking to others by proceeding in accordance with A, B, C, and D. You're not going to find a similar provision in any other advanced directives. It's pushing the limit on what can be done with stopping eating and drinking. Most advanced directives don't touch it. Some supplements for advanced directives do touch it but none of them combine all of it and put it all in one place and go as far as I go. I'm actually intentionally uh, pushing the, the envelope here. It certainly looks a lot different, I know, than the advanced directives that we looked at a few moments ago. I, I throw it out there for people to consider. I don't expect everybody to like it, I don't expect a lot of people to use it, but I think people have to know that this is the direction they can 
go if they want to. Of course, on my third page, if you move to the full third page, and this is the last page, uh, I have a place for additional provisions. I have the usual miscellaneous provisions, such as um, conservatorship and guardianship and organ donation and whether a is authorized or not and disposition of my remains. And then at the bottom, it's a signature. Now, in addition to those three pages, of course, you either get a notary who will have his own form to notarize your signature, or you have a, a California form for witnesses. It has to be a specific to California for witnesses uh, executed, or you can just have witnesses assign uh, a general provision, but it really should uh, follow California law to make sure you've got a legal advance directive. So we'll start with the questions that have come in in the Q&A. But if anyone else has a question they'd like to ask, either type it in the Q&A option or please select raise hand and we can unmute you so you can ask your question. So, Bill, the first question that we've received is about um, how Nevada is now addressing um, the option to stop eating and drinking in advance directives. Well, I kind of invited this question. I didn't think it would come first, <laughs> but I, I do want to talk about it. Nevada actually addresses the issue of the agent's authority after capacity is lost when you have dementia. And in Nevada, you you don't need to worry about uh, exposing your agent to a criminal charge. It's not going to happen. That is, if the agent institutes VSED after you uh, have dementia and lost your capacity. Nevada law is clear in this regard that this can be done. You don't need a fancy paragraph like my paragraph five. Now, there are a couple of states that clearly say that doesn't work in that state. But for the remaining 40 some, 43 states, nobody knows whether you can go that far in your advanced directive. That's why I have written my five in such a crazy way where you, it applies if they're at risk criminally uh, and you can proceed with number five if you're not at risk. Hopefully, laws will change and become more clear that it's not risky. Okay, next. Our next question is, in an advanced directive, can you name a backup agent if your first choice is unable or unwilling to be your agent when the time comes? Well, yes, that's, ex that's expected. All forms have a provision for a second or even a third ag agent. And it's very clear that if it's not just if your first agent dies, if your first agent refuses to participate, then it goes automatically to your second designated agent. Thank you for that clarification. I passed over it. Next question. There seem to be a few different advanced directive forms to use. Can we just use your website and the forms that you have listed there when completing an advanced directive? Good question. Thank you. Um, you don't need a form. You can do this from scratch. All you have to do is get it properly executed. You can write it out on a piece of brown paper and just get it properly executed and you've got an advanced directive. The reason the forms exist is because people don't know what to write in their advanced directives. So the forms give guidance and most forms make it clear that you can modify the form. So find a form that fits your viewpoint because everybody has a little different take on how they want to end their life and modify it to fit your view. It's 
the only view that counts in all of this is what your what you view. What are your wishes? It's not the wishes of your agent. Make sure your agent understands that it's your wishes, not his or her wishes that matter. And if you find one that says, oh, I, I, I do it this way, you don't want that agent. Also, when you're dealing with an agent, it doesn't necessarily have to be a family member. In fact, in many families, it shouldn't be a family member. You can hire a fiduciary to be your agent, or you can have a friend be your agent. The key thing, besides knowing what your wishes are, is to be forceful, to be an advocate for you. And if you've got somebody that's kind of a, a mammy pamby, maybe that's not the person to be your agent. Your agent has to be aggressive. They have to be willing to talk back to the doctor. I think that answers the question. We have a few more questions related to Nevada. And you might, um, we might need to clarify whether these questions are about um, advanced directives in Nevada or medical aid in dying in Nevada. So the first question was, can an agent initiate medical aid in dying in Nevada if the principal loses capacity? And they specify they don't just mean VSED, seems like they mean medical aid in dying made specifically. All right, well, let's deal with the made issue then. Where is where is the patient? Where is the agent in Nevada? In this case, it's about medical aid and dying in Nevada. And are they Nevada residents? Do I need to know these specifics to answer the question? I'm sorry. Well, that's okay. We do have another question specifically about residency requirements in Nevada. And we also have um, our board member, Dr. Donald Moore, who um, can speak about MAID as well. But I believe this question is for a Nevada resident, if they lose capacity, can their agent initiate medical aid in dying? Well, if you've lost capacity, you've all probably lost the ability to have the consistent ability to stop eating and drinking. It's just not in your wheelhouse anymore. You, you need to institute VSED when you're still very able to think clearly over a long period of time. So as a, as a practical matter, a, a person with dementia and with no capacity, they're incapacitated, isn't going to do even if they wanted to maybe a few days ago they're not going to be able to do that day after day remember vsed takes three to 15 or 18 days so your agent's ability to do that now if here's a trick about vsed if it's not a trick it's just an anomaly in the law really but it's very clear, if you have your capacity and you decide you wanna die by stopping eating and drinking, and you go do that for a couple of days, and then you become weak and you become bedridden and your family continues to withhold food and fluid, there is no case, there is no indication that the family is at risk criminally because you started it and carried through with it for several days on your own. So if the fam family finishes it up, that is, continues to withhold food and fluid, that's not a problem. It's when you can't start it yourself and keep it going for a couple of days, that is the problem. Now, uh, let's talk about VSCD. Donnie may want to add to it. Let's talk about, excuse me, uh, made medical aid and dying which in California is the End of Life Option Act. People need to understand that medical aid in dying is different in every state. There are only 10 states that have it, and uh, every state calls it by a different name. Uh, 
the basics of the laws in these 10 states, one of which is not a state, it's District of Columbia. Um, and maybe they're the 11th, I've lost count. Um, the three basics of, of medical aid and dying are that you have less than five, uh, six months to live, you have your mental capacity, and you're able to ingest the compounded medication because it's not very tasteful and you have to do it through your mouth or possibly uh, through your rectum. Um, Donnie can address that if he wants. Uh, or maybe you can squeeze a pump in your arm if you can't lay your ALS patient and you can't get your arm to your mouth. There's a work around that. But the doctors can't do it for you. They cannot in interject a medication in your arm. Now, they can in Canada. So Canada's, in my opinion, way ahead of us on this point. Now you get into the problem when you come to medical aid and dying about residency. All of the laws that were passed contain a provision that says you have to be a resident of a state. If you live now in Oregon or Vermont, they have changed the residency requirement and they've done away with it because lawsuits were filed and said that's discriminatory under, I think, the federal constitution. So in those two states, people can go to that state and not become a resident. But remember, it's easy to change your residency. To change your residency, you just need to go to that state, get a driver's license, or rent an apartment for a month. Brittany Maynard did that because she couldn't die in California uh, with medical aid and dying. So she had to go to Oregon. She's the one that more than anybody got the law changed in California to allow medical aid and dying. But it wasn't changed before she died. So she went to Oregon to die. Uh, that's terrible. So it's good to get rid of the residency. It has created some problems for health providers that prescribe when people come from out of state and prescribe and then go back to their own state because their own state doesn't allow it. I don't, I'm not going to get into that. Uh, there are people that do get into it, and there's a website that I think discusses it some. Um, so you're talking about medical aid and dying. It's a, it's a different world than living in a state that doesn't have it. But maybe somebody can refine their questions based on information I've just given. Donnie, what do you have to add? Uh, I think you pretty much uh, answered it. All right. Uh, Donnie, well, let me explain who Donnie is. He's a board member, uh, but he's a physician who has had training in end of life issues, and he has. Uh, kind of made it his practice to deal with people that are facing the kinds of issues we've been discussing in terms of their life. So uh, there's another doctor in town, Dr. Bob Uslander, that I mentioned in one of my slides that's been doing this kind of practice for a number of years. And uh, Dr. Uslander and probably Donnie work outside of Medicare. In other words, they're not restricted by all the rules of Medicare to get paid. So who pays them? Well, the patient pays them. Although normally you'll have, correct me, Donnie, if I'm wrong, uh, an initial interview that's free. So maybe you can add something uh, to what I've said about you and Dr. Bob. Uh, yes, that, that was correct. Um... Yeah, I mean, I, I do perform services of, of medical aid and dying um, and some voluntary stuff, so eating and drinking. Uh, and yeah, and honestly, Bill, I think you covered it really well um, and honestly have spoken on uh, advanced directives in a very comprehensive way, too. Um, if there's any specific questions, I am definitely happy to, uh, you know, contribute to them. Okay, Sarah, how about the next question? 
All right, we're going to take um, a question from one of the attendees. Um, so Chris Palmer, I have um, unmuted you and or allowed you to unmute. Um, so go ahead and ask your question. Okay, th thank you so much, Bill. Thanks for a great presentation. Sarah, thank you for organizing all this. Here's my, here's my question, Bill. Um, um, if you want to die and use medical aid in dying to do so, and if you still have decision-making capacity, but you are not within six months of dying, can you begin to implement V said to bring you within six months of dying and therefore be able to use medical aid in dying? Um, okay. If you can convince the doctor that you're definitely going to do this, I guess the doctor can opine that you have less than six months to live. I'm not so sure that that's going to work. Uh, that's a very interesting question. Um, Donnie, how would you handle that? I would say uh, it's it's not advisable. I think as Bill astutely stated, um, it's kind of dependent on the clinician and uh you know, as to whether or not that's something that, you know, that they would be comfortable with. I think that once you initiate voluntarily stopping eating and drinking, there's a more likely chance that you'll um, kind of lose decision-making capacity before you're able to transition over to then pursuing aid and dying. You know, a lot of times you will have already sort of gone through the challenging parts of stopping and eating and drinking. And once you enter the phase where you would maybe qualify for aid and dying, you're already in sort of that really terminal and advanced stages of stopping eating and drinking and really entering the end at that point. So I think most providers would uh, advise that you just continue on with that process and with, you know, adequate support from the medical team comfortably um, pass away that way. I think from a legal point of view, you're going to run into this problem. The judges are going to look at the public policy behind the medical aid and dying law. And it's designed for people that are suffering greatly and are determined, have been determined that they are going to die within six months. And if somebody voluntarily becomes near the end of life, they're outside the, the intent of the law. And courts often look at the, the, the intent of the law, the intent of the people who wrote it. And it wasn't intended for, intended for your kind of situation that you've given to us. So I think it's unrisky to expect to get a doctor to write you a death prescription after you're halfway through VSED. I wouldn't go there. I, like Donnie says, I just finish up with VSED. Thank you. Thank you both very much. Thank you, Sarah. All right. We have a number of um, questions about advanced directives. So let's continue with those. So the first question is, why does the UC, University of California medical system, have its own form? How is that form different from the form you've created, Bill, or from the California form that you showed at the beginning? Well, all hospitals have their own form. I, I, maybe there's some that just take the statutory form. Uh, the California Medical Association has tweaked the standard statutory form. And those, that's the form that most hospitals use. California UCSD, or just UC, I should say, because I think their policy system-wide has determined they didn't like the statutory form. They liked it. They liked the Creative Commons form and they wanted to make some changes to it. So they've really adopted the Creative Commons form for their own use. 
and their adoption, I think, is very good. Uh, it's not a major change in any way. Um, so, as I've said earlier, the form's not important. It just helps you along. It's your wishes and who you designate that are important. So th there's forms all over the map. You've seen several of the uh, forms and you've seen my form, which is rather extreme. I'm not, I'm not sure how to answer your question any further than that. Hey, next question. Can you talk about some situations you've seen where someone had an advanced directive, but there were issues when um, the advanced directive um, was carried out? Well, there are a number of law cases in, in various states where an inadequate advanced directive wasn't clear and and the the medical aid, the medical institutions are fighting something that's in it, or the family is fighting them among themselves about what it says. So it's it's a problem, and it's not unusual to have a, a advanced directive that's not clear. I think the way around that problem is one to write clearly. And two, to make sure your agent understands because your agent has the authority to speak for you and basically nobody else does. So if the agent is an outside member of the family and a member of the family wants to keep mom alive forever and the agent says, no, that's not their wish and their advanced directive makes it clear that I have the authority and that's their wish, they wanna die early, then the outside agent becomes the decision maker and the family's members decision is irrelevant assuming the hospital and the doctor want to follow the law now sometimes they don't but that's another issue another question is about vsed and the advanced directive form you've created bill so the question is, if the V said items on your advanced directive put someone at risk of attracting attention and possible legal problems or some sort of interference, would it be more prudent to just tell my agent what I want? Well, uh, is what would become controversial, the advanced directive? or the carrying out of the advanced directive? I'm not clear from what you read. Could you read it again? I believe that they are referring to um, writing it in the advanced directive. I'll read the question in full. I wonder if the V said items on your advanced directive put someone at risk of attracting attention and possible legal problems or interference. Would it be more prudent to just tell my agent what I want? No, it's not more prudent because for something that is radical as taking someone else's life, the courts clearly will demand a clear directive that makes it clear that's what they wanted. There are a number of lawsuits around the states where People wanted to die early, wanted their agent to help them die early. And the courts have said what was in the advanced directive was inadequate to make this intention clear. So the intention has to be clear. One of the things I do in my lectures, incidentally, I've kind of squished three lectures of uh, three and a half, four hours into 45 minutes. Um, they, uh, uh, I advise them to, uh, I've lost my train of thought. Uh, Sarah, what was I talking about? You were talking about um, the legal issues that come up if someone has only expressed their wishes to their agent, but has have not put it in writing in their advanced directive. 
Yeah, and I said that it, it, it has to be really clear in the advanced directive. Mm -hmm. um, there was something I wanted to add that has escaped me. Um, oh, yes, I know what it was. Good. I uh, advise that when somebody is executing this kind of advanced directive that's pushing the limits and they want to die early, that they take a video of them stating their wishes, maybe a video of them executing the advanced directive, and then see that the video is saved and made available uh, when the person dies or person gets hospitalized. Uh, now, the final exit network that some of you know about that has helped people with uh, in, inhaling inert gases uh, hasn't really jumped on the video board. In fact, in a conversation just a few months ago, I had one of the staff at Final Exit Network say they're opposed to the videos because their fear is that they'll get into social media and become widespread. So if you're going to do a video, you've got to, I, I, it's a legitimate concern. So to deal with it, you got to trust the person that's going to keep your video and you don't want to spread it around while you're alive. You just keep it available. We have another form, or excuse me, question for you, Bill, um, specifically about your form. And the question is, why does your form have the doctor's name on it? Would we have to redo the form each time we change doctors? Um, is there possible confusion if we've created multiple versions of the advanced directive? All right, that's easy to answer. Yes, you shouldn't have multiple versions. Every Your latest version should say that all prior advanced directives are rescinded. Um, and the rule of law is anyway that the last one will control when there's a conflict. That's basically a criminal or contract law. Um, the uh, if you change doctors, that's the basic question. Yeah, you ought to do this. You ought to write a supplement that just says. I'm changing my doctors and attach it to your uh, uh, primary pri uh, advanced directive. But I suspect that if you just attach the note and didn't get it executed properly with two witnesses or a notary, people would still honor it. I think it's a minor change uh, and an expected change. Uh, but the, the best way, the legal way to do it is to make a an amendment, and you can amend and just attach your amendment. You don't have to rewrite a thing. Just change the one provision that it, that needs changing. Another question. Do you know of anyone who has successfully used your advanced directive? No, I don't. Uh, I haven't. That form's only been out for, um, I don't know, is Pat listening? Um, it's only been in that condition where it's extreme like this for four or five months. But my prior drafts, if you notice in one corner, I think we're at draft number 14. So my drafts go back more than 10 years. Um, it's gotten more and more aggressive as I've gone along. But I'm not aware of anybody using it. They don't call me up or send me a note saying, Bill, I'm using your form and I'm going to die tomorrow. I just don't know. My question goes back. There, there was a prior question about uh, starting to stop eating and drinking and then getting medical aid and dying. And that, that went nowhere. But that raised the question in my mind. If a person, if, if I was to start not eating and drinking, and as I progressed along, would I become eligible for hospice care? Okay. Uh, I deal with that in one of my lectures. Uh, that's up to the hospice. Uh, some hospices embrace VSCD, some won't touch it, and some will take you after you've done it three or four days and, and you're for sure going to go through with it. 
One of the problems with hospice is they get paid by the federal government, i.e. Medicare. So in order to qualify, there is that six month rule. They have to be terminal to be eligible for hospice. So you have to get the opinion of the, the hospice doctor that you're terminal. That way they get paid. Otherwise you have to pay. Most hospices don't even know that you could pay um, and not rely on the federal government to pay them. But that's always how been- many, How many days of not eating and drinking is it until I'm terminal? For you and, your, and the doctor at the hospice will have to determine that. Uh, let me answer it this way. If you're, if you're feeble, and in bed most of the time, you institute VSED, you may become bedridden and in a coma in a matter of a day or two. However, if you're healthy, or some people I've just learned cannot be too healthy, but still live a long time, longer than 14 days. So there's no hard answer to that. It's a question of how convincing are you that you're halfway there or more? It's going to be up to the hospice doctor to make that decision. There's no hard and fast rule. Uh, clearly, if you're still walking around, which you will be the first couple of days, you're not going to qualify for hospice. Thank you, Bill. You're welcome. Next question. Um, this is about you've mentioned that um, Nevada handles um, their advanced directives and stopping eating and drinking a bit differently. So can you tell us about um, the law in Nevada that um, allows them to address that differently? Uh, I really can't. I, I've read the provision that uh, is so unusual because no other state has it, but I can't tell you any more about its set of laws other than it doesn't have medical aid in dying. Uh, I'm just, uh, the real issue that comes up that nobody's asked about, but I'm going to jump into this anyway, because uh, a famous lawyer, not a famous lawyer, but a well-known lawyer in the right to die field by the name of Thaddeus Pope has written that non residents, people in California, in other words, can write in their advanced directive that I'm writing my advanced directive to pursuant to Nevada law, and I want it carried out pursuant to Nevada law. And then you theoretically can presume that the Nevada law will apply. And this is quite common when you write a contract. There are two parties that live in California, but they can contract among the two of them, that the laws of Delaware will apply. And the courts will look at Delaware law to interpret the contract. Can that same sort of reciprocity occur in VSED? Uh, I don't think so. Even though Pope talks about it, I've gotten him to admit in a recent phone call conversation with him, email conversation with him, that yeah, he's being pretty pretty optimistic about that. The courts are not are going to apply public policy of some kind not to allow California residents to take advantage of Nevada law. You would have to go to Nevada and uh, become a resident. Now to become a resident, as Brittany Maynard easily showed us, you just, and I mentioned, you just have to go up and rent an apartment for a month and declare that you want to be a resident of Nevada. I, I assume Nevada is very similar to most states in California. It's easy to get residency. Just go move. Uh, and you're, you're not going to come back, <laughs> except maybe in a box. Uh, so I don't, don't think the residency is a really big issue. A lot of people have moved to take advantage of uh, the state and become a resident of the state. Next question. Um, do you have a book that includes all of the presentations that you've created? <laughs> yeah. Well, 
actually, uh, you put my three sets of slides together, you may have a book. Because like today, or even better than today, because I did a better job in other cases, uh, there's a lot of information in my three sets of slides. My first lecture is on how to write an advanced directive, and before that, the importance of family conversations, and before that, where to go to look for information. My second lecture is about the California in the Life Option Act, i.e. medical aid and dying, and about also about uh, hospice. And then my third one's all about dementia. So no, I don't have a book, and I doubt if I will ever have a book. Uh, I'm in the process writing three booklets for the institution where I now am a retiree. I don't feel very retired uh, considering how I've lectured three times this week, but um, the booklets are gonna cover three different subjects. Uh, one's planning. I'm gonna condense my three lectures to about 12 pages. Uh, and I can make that available uh, once the uh, res resident management here approves it. The second booklet's gonna be about with some help from another um, uh, person, a chaplain, uh, about how to talk to people and, and that are ill. How do you talk to them? And how do you deal with their doctors? How do you, and what, what to say to them and what not to say to them, what to ask, and what not to ask. And then the third one is already written, but needs revision is on bereavement. What, what, needs to be done after a person dies and how do you how do you handle the the bereavement of the family so we're going to have three booklets hopefully they'll be finished by the end of the year so get back to me later in the year and maybe i can make one or two of those available or all three wonderful all right so we have um just two more questions to finish in the last three minutes so Bill, do you recommend making a video to expand upon the directions you give to your agent um, to help them in that decision-making process? Does the questioner mean, do I, am I gonna make a video to go about I, that? I believe they mean that, um, is it helpful to make a video recording yourself speaking to articulate your wishes in more depth to your chosen agent? I think that's a good idea. Uh, that's an excellent idea. And then, then if anybody questions the agent, the agent's got proof of what the instructions were. And the, the agent could say, oh, I'm just following what's in this video. I think that's a great idea if that's what you mean. I hadn't thought of it myself. Uh, I may put that idea into my slides. Thank you. All right, last question. Do you recommend using a state or national advanced directive reg registry in case you become incapacitated when you're away from home? Well, there's certainly no harm in using those registries. I don't, uh, but I could see an advantage to them. I, the thing is, I don't think the hospitals and the doctors are attuned to going there to find your advanced directive. So I'm not sure how much play they get. Uh, there's been a state registry for some time and I just haven't heard much about it. What's important is that not only do your family know about your wishes, but they have a copy of your advanced directive and that your doctor has a copy of your advanced directive and your hospital has a copy of your advanced directive. Those are the people that need to know what your wishes are. And uh, I suggest when it comes to the letter to your agent that spills out what your wishes are in more detail, at least under my system, then that letter be attached to your advanced directive. Now the letter can be changed as long as it's within the scope of the advanced directive. So you can change the letter as long as it's within the scope of the advanced directive anytime. 
but put the new letter in with your old advanced directive so people have both. I just don't see a real need for the registries. No harm. Well, it's now three o'clock, so we um, will close the event. Bill, I want to thank you for um, providing your expertise. Um, this was really a helpful um, overview of advanced directives and a wonderful opportunity to hear about um, the work you've done to enable people to address dementia and stopping eating and drinking in their advanced directive. So thank you for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Yes, it's been my pleasure, everyone. And you can always email me if you have more questions. Just email me uh, or, uh, yeah, I don't go for phone calls unless the emails bring me to make a phone call to somebody, but I do take a lot of email questions. Wonderful. And I just want to encourage everyone to also visit um, Bill's website, www.finalexodus.org, where all of this information and more um, is available. So it's the perfect place to go um, if you're beginning working on an advanced directive or really at any stage of um, the end of life planning process. And finally, if you found this event useful, please consider making a donation to Hemlock Society um, that will allow us to continue to bring um, you these types of events.